I'm heading out across Britain to find the history embedded in the landscape. This is a country where you're never very far from an ancient routeway, a glimpse of lost industry, or a grand monument from our past. So from coastal paths to hilltop tracks, I've started doing some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me to a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time, I'm in the Lake District, a walker's paradise. But I'm here for a very special reason, to tread in the footsteps of historical giants, the Romans. At the northern edge of their empire, this stunning area was the great challenge facing the Romans. But with their military might, brilliant engineering and some clever politics, I'll see how they plundered the riches of this awesome landscape. The Lake District National Park attracts millions of visitors each year. But 2,000 years ago, the task facing the Roman invaders was conquering and then controlling this unknown landscape. From their arrival in 43 AD, it took the Romans nearly three decades to push this far up the country. Just to the north of here, they would famously go on to build Hadrian's Wall, the boundary of their empire, leaving this area as the northernmost outpost of Rome. My 54-mile walk is a remarkable Roman road trip across the highest ground in England. I'm starting my most challenging walk to date at Penrith and nearby Broom Castle. As much a gateway to the lakes today as it was for the Romans. From there, I'm heading into Lakeland, to Ullswater, to pick up an extraordinary Roman road built across mountaintops to help conquer this territory. Day two, and I'm exploring mineral-rich valleys to find out how the Romans exploited their new province as I make my way to the heart of the lakes at Ambleside. It's back to the high ground on day three, following the legionaries up mountain passes to discover how the ancient Britons were kept in check at Hard Knot Fort. My final day should be plain sailing, downhill to the Irish Sea and Ravenglass, the key Roman port that connected this region with their vast empire. Penrith, my start point, is a town familiar to nearly all of us who visit the lakes by road or rail. The reason it's a tourist hub now is for exactly the same reason that the Romans were here 2,000 years ago. It's geography. With the Lakeland Fells over there, the Pennines over there, it's the perfect junction. But Penrith hardly reeks of Romans. So I'm heading to the edge of town in search of something a little more ancient. Not the prettiest stretch of my walk, you should know, but it's vital if I'm to find the Roman gateway to this area. And here it is, Broom Castle. It doesn't look particularly Roman either. In fact, it's 13th century, built by the High Sheriff of Cumberland, a defence against marauding Scots. Apparently there's more to Broom Castle than meets the eye, and the clue as to what it is, is up there. Well hidden in the upper reaches of this crumbling ruin, there's a remarkable remnant that predates the castle by a thousand years. A Roman gravestone. Yep, here it is. Apparently it starts to the spirits of the departed, but I can't see that. Titius M, yeah, look, there's Titius M. Lived for 32 years, more or less. And his brother put up this inscription. Very nice of him. So how did a Roman inscription find its way up here? Amazingly, the answer is below me. Can you see that there is 
a bank running directly towards that white building. That is all that's left of a Roman fort. The High Sheriff of Cumberland was clearly no respecter of antiquities, pilfering any Roman stones he could find when he was building this castle back in the 1200s. Under Roman rule, we believe this site was called Bracarvum. But as early as 71 AD, this gap in the hills was the possible meeting point for two legions pushing north through Britain. I'm meeting archaeologist Lindsay Allison Jones to find out what brought them here. Britain was made up of a lot of tribes and each regarded the Roman invasion in their own way and the Romans worked with them in a different way. Some tribes you could bribe to behave themselves, some tribes um, you had to really stomp on. When the Romans arrived in Britain, this area was controlled by the Brigantes. They were a tribe of farmers, horse breeders and metal workers occupying land from the northern Midlands to southern Scotland. Their queen was one of many British leaders who did deals with the Romans to maintain her own power. Brigantes initially um, were quite amiable about the Romans. Carter Mandua, their queen, had become a client kingdom of, of Rome. Um, but her husband didn't enjoy this at all. He, he rebelled against both his wife and the Romans. And that meant that there was danger up here. They, the Romans no longer had a friendly buffer tribe between them and the people up in Scotland. And so they really needed to be sorted out. What size of army did the Romans bring with them when they came? In the Lake District, we know there were two legions. There was the 20th Legion under Agricola coming up the west side, and there was the 9th Legion under um, Cerealis coming up the east side. So how many men would that have been? Well, it's five and a half thousand men per legion, plus hangers-on and extras, baggage trains, all the rest of it. So it would have been an enormous campaign. I mean, the locals must have been horrified at the sight of all these people surging up inexorably. The scale of this military deployment is quite extraordinary. 11,000 troops. An invading army half the size of the local population at the time. But these Roman legionaries weren't just systematically suppressing the Brigantes. They were also busy building. Roads are essential. You have to build roads as soon as you possibly can because that's the way you get your troops backwards and forwards, that's the way you get your supplies through. So Roman roads were a priority. Get those built and you had control over the area. And today, routes originally engineered by the Romans have become this area's greatest transport arteries. The M6 running north to south and the A66 running east to west. But I'm leaving Brocavum and heading west in search of a more obscure Roman legacy. The highway they'd create through the heart of our national park all the way to the Irish Sea. The gentle valley of the River Emont was their initial access to the Lakeland Mountains, a route which enabled them to monitor a traditional meeting place. Cool. <laughs> That's quite a size, isn't it? These are the stones of Maybra Henge. They'd already been in place for two and a half thousand years when the Romans arrived here. According to the archaeologists, there used to be eight of them. But someone's nicked seven. To the Romans, these standing stones and henges probably confirmed their suspicions that us Britons were barbarians. Four and a half miles on, and I've entered the National Park, heading for one of the most popular valleys of all. Hooley Bridge sits at the northern tip of Ullswater. No shortage of holiday makers today. And once upon a time, no shortage of ancient Britons either. Beneath those trees, there's actually an Iron Age hill fort which belonged to the local tribes. The old name for this is Dun Mallard, which means Fort of the Slaughter. Sadly for the locals, the Romans earmarked a route just a few hundred yards away for their Lakeland Highway. 
Yeah, look, that's the Iron Age Hill Fort. So that's where I am there. And here is a Roman road cutting right through the centre of the lakes. It's called High Street. Don't think of some great long thoroughfare full of shops. It's not Oxford Circus, it's called High Street because it's so high. In fact, it's as high as the top of that ridge. Instead of plotting a route along the shore of Ullswater, the Romans built their road here, bypassing the valley entirely. So why were the Romans building a road right up there? Were they mad? Well, carpe diem, as the Romans used to say. Now, straight roads aren't something you'll find a lot of in the lakes. But I know enough about Roman roads to know they were carefully planned and were built straight. Up here, it seems the Romans got their way. Of course, a bit of a schlep up here, isn't it? Joining me at the top of this climb is Ian Gray. Where is this famous Roman road? Well, this is it. It comes from uh, the Penrith direction over there. What? From, from over, over the top over of this the hill, hill here? Yeah. This is High Street, a remarkably straight 23 and a half mile route between the Roman fort of Procavum and the heart of the lakes. The route's been in continuous use for nearly 2,000 years with thousands of walkers still benefiting from its Roman engineering. You know, I've just noticed how, how incredibly boggy it is in the ditch, whereas here, it's rock hard. It just shows you how well the Roman road was constructed, even after 2,000 years. This naturally waterlogged area has this, still has this sort of raised causeway running through it. Yeah, you can see here, here can't you, where it's eroded, that it's immediately reverted back into being bog again. Yeah. Like hundreds of footpaths around the Lakeland Fells, High Street's popularity means it's in regular need of repair. This vital work is carried out by Ian and the Fix the Fells team. We actually use the Roman techniques because they, they turn out to have been really sort of handy way of creating a dry path. The Romans sort of tended to build roads according to the materials they had nearby. Yeah, this is the, uh, the surface material which, was, which would have been dug from the ditches this either, stuff. either side. Yeah, this is, this is the pinnel. This is the uh, product of the glacial action producing this boulder clay material. This is like, quarried out and just laid on the surface. When mixed with water, it, it actually resembles uh, wet cement. And as it dries and hardens, it forms a really hard-wearing surface. You can oh. actually see it is really, really resistant. We sometimes use machinery. A JCB will sort of go along digging out the ditch gathering stones and building up a mound and then flattening it. Whereas in the Roman times, they just had people with picks and shovels to do it all by hand. So it's quite remarkable that they actually managed to create these mile after mile. Once you've got here, the Roman strategy really makes sense. From over two and a half thousand feet, this road gave them commanding views over the territory. Up here, they were safe from possible ambush in the wooded lowlands below. High Street is a masterpiece of planning and execution. But on a hot day in the middle of summer, it's no mean prospect. When I first looked at this route on the map down by the lakeside, I thought the Romans must have been balmy building a road up here. But now I'm at the top, I can see that it does make sense. Can you see? We're on a long, long plateau, and beyond it, that's Penrith. All you needed to do was to get up onto this plateau, and then you've got mile after mile after mile of relatively flat ground across the fells to carry your weapons and your equipment. On its way to Ambleside, the Roman road rolls over peak after peak. And almost 2,000 years later, the highest mountain on its route has become a lasting testimony to the Romans. It's simply called High Street. Oh, this is an amazing spot, isn't it? 
there's Helvellyn and the central peaks of the lakes. With roads like this to support them, it took just two years for the Romans to crush the Brigantian rebels. By 73 AD, this region was a functioning part of Provincia Britannia. You can just imagine being one of those Roman commanders standing up here, surveying my territory beneath me. After the most demanding day's walking I've ever done, and in an 80 degree heat wave, I'm done in. This is where I step off the Roman road. I'm taking the direct path downwards to Arlswater and hopefully a good night's kip. Tomorrow, I'll be finding out what the Romans plan to do with their newly won territory. It's day two of my Roman road trip across the Lake District. So far, I've got a sense of the brutality they needed to conquer this harsh environment. The last region to be permanently brought into Roman Britannia. After a pretty strenuous walk yesterday, I think I've earned something a bit more relaxing. Hey, here she comes. Having made it halfway down Alleswater, I'm starting day two with a ferry ride. From the southern tip of this nine mile long lake, I'm heading for the Kirkston Pass, discovering how the Romans began exploiting this landscape. Over the pass, and it's downhill to England's largest lake, Windermere, and the Romans' base in the centre of the region at Ambleside. The Ullswater steamers have been ferrying tourists and walkers up and down this valley for over 150 years. The service dates from the time when tourists first flocked to this area, inspired by romantic poet and local lad, William Wordsworth. It was on the shores of this very lake that Wordsworth saw his host of golden daffodils. Just over there, by that tree stump. I'm getting off at Glen Ridding at the southern end of Alleswater. Thank you, Brian. Heading southwest parallel to my route yesterday, with the Romans High Street way above me. Walking through this serene stretch beside Brothers Water, mining isn't the first thing that springs to mind. But having brought the region under control in 73 AD, Roman thoughts swiftly turned to plundering the local resources. This had always been part of their grand plan. Even before their invasion, Strabo, the Roman historian, had described our island as rich in silver, gold and iron. Ian, hi. Oh, hi, Tony. I've arranged to meet Ian Tyler, who's been studying the history of mining in this landscape for 50 years. In the Lake District, we had round about 20 different commercial minerals, and probably the most predominant that they would have been interested in is the lead. Now, I've just got a small sample for you here. Yeah. And as you can see... Well, I mean... <laughs> that was a shock! <laughs> And oh, you can that see is so heavy, isn't it? How beautiful it is. Yeah. But I mean, this is your roofing. They certainly had windows, they certainly had pipes. Yeah. And this was a very, very important resource. Ian's leading me to one of the many disused lead mines round here. Across a landscape that's proved as bountiful as it is beautiful. Because the Romans haven't been the only people who've been interested in the lake's natural resources. Far from it, mining through the ages has made finding any direct Roman evidence a bit tricky. But here at the 17th century Hartsop Hall mine, you can still see evidence of traditional mining techniques similar to the ones the Romans used. 
Roman mines were generally first cut by skilled military engineers. But after that, the miners themselves would have likely been a mix of free men and slaves working in incredibly dangerous conditions. Well, this is really the working part of the mine now. From this side to this side is where the vein was. This is where all the goodies are. And this is what's been taken out. And this is the traditional methods of working. These little indentations here is where they put their timbers in to go from one side to the other. They would stand on this and work upwards. Then they would do the same thing again. So it's just simple technology, but it works. Mining was among the most prosperous activities of Roman times. And by the late first century, Britannia was one of the empire's leading producers of lead. That was some experience. So no wonder the authorities were keen to have control of these mineral-rich mountains. Time for me to walk on southwards to my next Roman destination at Ambleside, six miles away. At this point, the soldiers up on High Street would have been marching straight through on their plateau highway. But for those of us foolish enough to have lost all that altitude, there's the small matter of the 1,500-foot Kirkston Pass to get up and over. Right at the top, some thoughtful soul has put the understandably popular Kirkston Pass in, one of the highest pubs in England. This has also become the highest place in Cumbria accessible by car. And the route leading down from here to Windermere is clearly quite a talking point. That road that snakes down there is called the Struggle. Well, let's go and see what all the fuss is about. I've walked quite a few kilometres today and the going uphill has been fine, no bother at all, but coming down now, my calves are starting to wobble a bit. There's a certain cumulative effect that takes hold after two days walking round here. But, as Wordsworth himself once wrote, who comes not hither, ne'er shall know how beautiful the world below. And the world below just here is Ambleside, the tourist centre at the very heart of the Lake District, full of all the big name local attractions. Most people know that Beatrix Potter lived in the Lake District and set her books here, but what not everybody knows, and maybe she didn't know either, was that her rabbits were Roman, or at least they were descended from Roman rabbits, because it was the Romans who brought rabbits to the Lake District, and now they've even got a Latin version of Peter Rabbit, Fabula de Petro Cuniculo. Look, once upon a time, there were four little rabbits, and their names were, this is great, Flopsar, Mopsar, Caudalinia, that's Cottontail, and Petrus, Peter Rabbit. Nice, isn't it? Sat on the northern tip of Windermere, with valleys radiating out in all directions, Ambleside is a hub, just as it was for the Romans. Their high street led them here, to a site they developed less than 20 years after those two legions first arrived in the northwest. The site may have been called Galeva, and it's where I'm meeting my old friend and archaeologist, David Schotter. Well, you're looking here at the Fort Granaries. Yeah. Here, you're looking at the headquarters building, the Principia, and then beyond, in the far distance, the commander's house, and these are the normal three buildings you find through the centre of the fort. Roman Ambleside was at the centre of a grid-like network of Roman forts across the Lake District. Each was built a day's march from the next, so troops could quickly cover any potential uprising by the Brigantes. So it was a kind of hub for the Roman infrastructure, really, for this area. We sometimes underestimate the amount that water transport was used, but this lake is an ideal one because it takes you southwards, practically as far as the coast of Cumbria. Some stuff will have been brought up the lake 
and it will have been put in the granaries for storage here temporarily until it was sent on to other sites in the, in, in the, in the Lake District. Hence the big granaries. Hence the big granaries and a large civilian settlement on the other side of the road, which you can't see anymore. A lot of the Britons, I think, were quite happy to do business. Uh, and, of course, the coming of law and order made civilised life a lot easier for them. The Romans were clearly saying, we're here to stay. And it seems the site's early development coincided with a period of peace in this region. But things didn't remain settled, as the Roman army had duties elsewhere. We know from inscriptions that one complete legion had been taken away in the late 80s and detachments of at least two others had been taken in the early 80s. So the legionary force in Britain might have been as small as about 10 to 12,000 by the late first century. This redeployment was prompted by an invasion at the opposite end of the empire near the river Danube. Now, the same number of troops it had taken to conquer the Lake District were spread across the whole of Britain. A new approach would clearly be required. Could the Romans win over the Brits and create a permanent Pax Romana? Tomorrow, I'm heading further west to find out. And I'll see the impact that was made by that most famous of all Romans in these parts. Hadrian. I'm on a quest through the Lake District, finding out how the Romans conquered and then controlled one of the toughest regions in their empire. Well, after two days walking, I've got to give them roads, forts and mines. But what about their people skills? Forget about what did the Romans ever do for us. Maybe the question we should be asking is, how did the Romans get on with us? Having spent the night at Ambleside, I'm walking west along wooded valleys, taking in Colworth Force, before joining my next Roman road on its mountainous ascent to the most exposed Roman fortress in the country. Eight miles east, though, I've reached a rather gentler setting the woodland of Little Langdale. This area might seem pretty lovely right now, but if you're in hostile territory and your enemy wanted to ambush you, it probably wouldn't look quite so appealing, would it? I've seen how the Brigantes were quickly suppressed by the might of two whole legions. But what about the longer term? I'm meeting Richard Hingley near the waters of Colworth Force to find out how ongoing local relations fared. The Romans probably had quite a lot of difficulty with these sorts of landscapes because it's very hard to keep order, to keep, uh, to observe and keep control of people. In Germany, the, Ro the Romans run into real trouble in the, first, the early first century AD um, when they send an army beyond the, uh, the Rhine and basically they're marching through forests and they get ambushed and a whole Roman army is wiped out. Do you think that the reason that the Romans sent such a big army into the Lake District was that they knew if they were coming somewhere like this, they ran the risk of being hammered as they had been uh, on the continent. Yes, the fact there's a military presence here into the 4th century rather does suggest that the Romans are having trouble with containing and controlling this particular landscape. So the lakes under the Romans remained something of a military state, but that didn't stop them trying to integrate properly with the locals. Some of the forts you've been to, Broome and Ambleside, have quite extensive viki in which you could actually, as a Briton, um, go to trade your extra produce in order to get money in return. So you've got the big stick, which is the military power, but then you've got the carrot, which is the economy. What about belief systems? The Romans, they're quite accommodating. So we have a number of local gods who are picked up by the Roman army and celebrated by the Roman army. An interesting example in this region is a local god called Belisicadros, who is attested by over 20 inscriptions in the area of the northwest England. Belisicadros must have been a warrior god in ancient Britain because the Romans chose to twin him with Mars, their own god of war. 
The inscriptions to Mars Belotokadros are so inconsistently spelt and poorly scripted, it suggests his worshippers weren't very high status. Probably native Britons and low-ranking legionaries. An ingenious attempt at unifying one population under Rome. But time for me to leave the forest and head on through Little Langdale to perhaps the most famous access route in modern Lakeland. The double header of Rhinos and Hard Knot Pass. This ridiculously demanding road has a near legendary status round here, famed for catching out all manner of travellers. And of course, its origins are Roman. Whereas High Street brought me into the lakes, this is my route out. The original artery between the Roman hub at Ambleside and the coast. Here, the challenge isn't so much altitude as pure gradient. At one in three, the road vies for the title of steepest in England. This is definitely not something I'd have wanted to do if I was a heavily kitted out Roman legionary. Give me the high street any time. These passes, though, were the best route through the western fells to the coast, and remain so to this day. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. I haven't got a bottle of water, I'm afraid. <laughs> This permanent link across mountains to the coast was a key part of Roman attempts to stabilise this difficult area. It was a process masterminded by the Roman we most associate with Northern Britain, Hadrian. When he became emperor in 117 AD, the Romans had been in the lakes for over 40 years. But at this point, the whole empire was in real danger. Hadrian's predecessor had pushed the boundaries of the Roman world further than ever before, from the lakes all the way to the Persian Gulf. The legions were now overstretched. Rebellions raged in several provinces, and round here the Brigantes, possibly in alliance with their neighbours in Scotland, were causing trouble again. The lakes needed policing. And that is a serious police station. Hardknot Fort is the only Roman mountain fort in Britain. Built on a rocky spur at an altitude of 800 feet, it commands views all the way to the coast. What a stunning fort this is. It's just great, isn't it? It's amazing. Lying just yards off Hardknot Pass, it's extraordinary how few Lakeland visitors seem to make it here, but it's where I'm meeting National Trust archaeologist Jamie Lund. The fort is believed to have been founded round about AD 120. I think this fort is less about campaigning and conquest and more about maintaining control over a territory. Do we know who the people were who manned this fort? This fort was constructed by the fourth cohort Delamatris, which is basically the fourth cohort uh, of the auxiliaries raised from Roman uh, Dalmatia. It includes those countries that we'd call today Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia. And that's the other end of Europe, isn't it? Why would they have done that? The Roman military were very clever. If they'd had a successful conquest of one area, they might try and encourage the people who have been newly conquered, all those fit fighting men, to join the Roman military machine and be posted somewhere to remove them from the temptation of uh, causing more trouble for the Romans back at home. But it must have been hard for them here. I mean, Dalmatia, I always think of that as the Adriatic coast and summer holidays. It must have been a huge culture shock to them. We know that the Roman soldiers uh, stationed on the northern frontier of Britain often uh, requested supplies from back home, uh, favourite foods, favourite sauces, spices, even socks to keep their feet warm. It wasn't just the cosmopolitan Roman army who had to front up the Lakeland weather. Hadrian is almost certainly the only emperor who ever visited this region. And it was he who decided a line must be drawn, quite literally. 
The stretched Roman machine had proved incapable of taming the Scottish mountains and their tribes, and a wall would now be built just 40 miles from here, separating barbarians from Romans. At the Irish Sea, Hadrian's Wall gave way to a series of naval ports and lookout towers known as the Western Sea Defences. That's where I'm heading tomorrow, westwards towards the sea. Because the port that was built there was of fundamental importance. It turned this whole area from just being a rural backwater into part of the Roman Empire. I'm walking through the Lake District National Park, following in Roman footsteps across this rugged landscape. Beginning of my final day's walking, and the bad news is that the sky is really clouded over and there's drizzle in the air. The good news is the change in terrain. That's the mountains I was walking over yesterday, but the Roman route today is much, much flatter. Rest my poor old legs. After a night's rest in Upper Eskdale, I'm setting off west through the aptly named village of Boot towards Munkester Castle, exploring how Romanised the Lake District became as I make my way to their port at Ravenglass, the region's connection with the wider Roman world. But before all that, I'm hitching a lift on board something rather special. Isn't that the cutest train you've ever seen? The Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway is affectionately known as the Little Railway, or Lal Ratty in the old local Cumbrian dialect. Nowadays, this narrow gauge steam railway is one of the most popular tourist attractions in the area, and quite rightly so, in my opinion. But when it was originally introduced in 1875, it was a proper working railway that transported the iron ore that was mined up in the local hills down into the valley. I bet the Roman miners wouldn't have minded one of these. Although the line continues all the way to the Romans' port at Ravenglass, I'm getting off halfway along, as there's investigating to be done in the lower reaches of Eskdale. I'm intrigued by the name of the place that I'm walking through. Look, it's Munkester. That's a very different name from, for instance, Birkby Fell, isn't it? That's a hill uh, in Viking. Lindbeck Gill. Gill is a Viking gully. Black Beck. Beck is a Viking river. But Munkester, that sounds like Lancaster or Chester, doesn't it? It's a Latin name. Very odd. On the flank of Munkester Fell, there's one of those sites rather unromantically classified as a scheduled ancient monument. It's virtually unreadable, isn't it? These Roman tile kilns are protected as a monument of national importance. Documented they may be, but well hidden they certainly are. There's red clay here. Yeah, look, can you see here a row of tiles like there? So presumably this thing could be a kiln? Oh, yes, look. They've got to be bricks or tiles, haven't they? So there's definitely something Roman about the history of Munkester. But quite what has been a cause of debate for over 200 years? The debate centres on this place, Munkester Castle. This has been home to the Pennington family for at least 800 years, and I'm here to meet the current owner. Welcome to Munkester. Thank you very much. Who's convinced of its Roman origins. Now, this was found in the foundations of the old Sparta Castle, the medieval Peel Tower, um, by Lord Munkester at the turn of the 19th century. We have this beautiful coin of Emperor Theodosius uh, from dating from AD 380 or thereabouts. The experts who poo-poo the idea say 
the aristocrats were always trying to, to, to show they came from a long lineage and sometimes they bought coins and happened to find them in their foundations. Is there anything in the shape of the castle that would indicate that it had a Roman origin? Roman forts come in, as I understand it, two sizes. They're either square shaped or plain card shaped. I think the plain card shape is approximately 80 metres by 140. Well, we do actually have an aerial photograph from the 1920s. You now, the existing castle that's still here today is about 80 metres that length. And if you go about 140 metres this way, you can see these strange, almost a right angle there. Just and, here? Yes, and yeah. some people think this early picture indicates perhaps it was this plain card shape. But with the Roman fort at Hardknot only nine miles away, and another one very nearby on the coast at Ravenglass, it seems unlikely the Romans would have built a full-blown fort just here. I suspect, if anything was here, it was a watchtower. And look at this point with this landscape. You're commanding the countryside. You're guarding the fords, the safe crossings over the river. Uh, you can see who's coming east, west, up and down the river there. It makes perfect sense to me. If I was a Roman officer, I'd want some soldiers stationed here. Well, Peter's reasoning is certainly persuasive. And for me, the lookout points around the castle and my last chance to take in the view of the National Park I've now pretty much crossed. Oh, that's pretty breathtaking, isn't it? That's the Scarfell Range over there where I've come from. But it would have been that view over there which would have been so crucial. And down there is my final destination, Ravenglass and the Roman port of Glenaventa. They say all roads lead to Rome, and in many ways, so did this one. Of all the locations I've visited, it was Glanaventa that connected Lakeland to Rome. Ravenglass's position on the estuary of three rivers, the Esk, Ert and Mite, made it the perfect natural harbour. In recent centuries, the estuary has silted up significantly, but in Roman Britain, the name Glanaventa meant market on the shore. While Penrith, where I started my journey, linked Roman lake land with the rest of Roman Britain, once Glenaventa was established, it became linked with all the sophistication of the rest of the Roman Empire. And if you want to know what I mean by that, take a look at this. Hi, Rachel. This is extraordinary, isn't it? Ravenglass Bathhouse is one of the largest surviving Roman structures in the country. And it's where I'm meeting archaeologist Rachel Newman. We're in the right place to start off with because this is where the people would have first come in. We think this was probably the changing rooms. The whole principle is to move from cold to warm because yeah. you've just come out of a Cumbrian winter after all. As you get steadily warmer, you can just gently relax the cares of the day away. It's a little bit of Rome in the northwest of England. And it's here because of the Roman fort that is just over the way. You passed this as you walked down, which was built, we know, at, at the time of Hadrian. And whilst this is for the soldiers, other people could use it as well at certain times. Who would those other people have been? Well, people who were attracted by the whole concept of Romanitas. It might be the ed edge of empire, but just because it's on the edge, it doesn't make it any less Roman. And of course, when you say Roman, they're not Roman from Italy, they're Roman from all over the empire. So the whole thing would have been very cosmopolitan. Oh, very much so. All sorts of people were here. You have a, a garrison of auxiliaries in the fort, and they'd have come from all over the place. We know that there was at least one Syrian in them because we have his discharge certificate from 8153, known as a diploma. And we know it survived here because he decided to stay here. He met and married someone local and remained here, presumably, for the rest of his life. In the second and third centuries, being a Roman had little to do with what language you spoke or where you were born. What mattered were shared values, customs and a way of life, like using this bathhouse. And from the busy port here at Glanaventa, all manner of prized British goods were exported. We know that ingots of British lead ended up in Gaul. Hunting dogs and grain also went overseas and British winter cloaks were in demand as far away as Turkey, so much so 
the powers in Rome had to control supply and stipulate a maximum price. But by the mid-fourth century, all this would draw to a close, as the central authority in Rome began to disintegrate. Raids by Irish pirates signalled the beginning of the end of the Roman Lake District. And in 410 AD, the Roman military protection of Britain was officially withdrawn. What I found really fascinating on this walk has been the sheer scale and endeavour of the Roman conquest of the Lake District. After the initial fighting, they really tried to get people involved in their world. And what a world it was. It's amazing to think that for 300 years, this much-loved national park, with its almost forgotten coastal village, was a buzzing, commercial and sophisticated part of the great Roman Empire. Standing here in the second decade of the 21st century, with a warm evening breeze and the water lapping at my feet, I can only just about imagine what fabulous riches came and left here nearly 2,000 years ago. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you can download a guide to my walk by going to www.channel4.com. Tony's back tomorrow with a Time Team special. Have the history books got it wrong on the location of 1066, the lost battlefield at 8? But coming up from penny arcades to global domination, from geeks to mainstream, get ready, player one. Charlie Brooker's How Video Games Changed the World. <laughs>